Okay, uh, well, we're going to finish uh, by talking about uh, these patients with these uh, difficult tibia fractures, which really can be the scourge of the uh, on-call orthopedic uh, surgeon. Um, so again, we're going to touch on difficult tibia fractures, some problems, and some solutions. Uh, and this is going to be based off of uh, uh, this paper, which is part of the uh, longitudinal assessment uh, materials, the controversies in intramedullary nailing of proximal and distal tibia fractures. And this paper is a little bit different um, than some of the ones we've heard about so far in that it's a review paper. And so we're going to really touch on uh, some of the approaches and techniques uh, that hopefully can be helpful to your practice and, and update uh, some of the information uh, that is now available since this was published in 2014. So the objectives here, we're going to identify problem fractures. We're going to discuss the intraoperative challenges uh, that they uh, pose and, and uh, provide an update on some effective uh, management uh, techniques. And so this is not really what we're talking about. So uh, uh, ismal or near ismal diaphyseal tibia fracture uh, is really something where you can do just about uh, uh, whatever you uh, want and, and have a reasonably good outcome. So this is a more technically forgiving. Uh, fracture, most of us probably would treat with an intramedullary uh, nail. And here's this patient at three months gone on to uh, uneventful healing in uh, in good alignment. Uh, Dr. Bishop, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Christy. We're having a little problem with your slide. I'm only seeing uh, a white slide. It's blank. Uh, okay. Sorry. Is that any different? No. Um, let me try and send you another invite. Give me one. Oh, I see. Okay. There. Thank you. Seems like we're back. Anyhow, so sorry about that. As I was saying, an ismal or near ismal diaphyseal tibia fracture treated with a medullary nail, a little bit more technically forgiving. And so uh, lots of variations on how you can do this and uh, likely to be a successful outcome. Here are going to be some more difficult uh, problems. So here's a, the proximal tibia fracture, and, and this is a problem. Uh, the characteristic deformity here is going to be valgus and, and apex anterior. And, and so you've got some options as to how you want to deal with this. You can uh, abort a nailing procedure and treat it with a plate. Uh, you can use an extended or semi-extended technique. You can employ blocking screws or other open techniques. And so we're going to touch on all these things in a little bit more detail. So just plate it. Uh, I think plating uh, of the proximal tibia is a very uh, reasonable and feasible option. Uh, it has some pros. I, I do believe it's technically uh, easier, especially if you're not doing challenging nailing cases all the time. Uh, plate fixation uh, is a little bit a uh, little bit more forgiving and perhaps more familiar. Uh, and the outcomes are similar. And so if you look at what's out there in the literature, plate fixation and the proximal tibia, totally reasonable option. There are some downsides uh, from a biomechanical point of view, uh, perhaps not as optimal, especially if you want to uh, proceed with early weight bearing, which can be helpful. Uh, particularly in polytraumatized or older patients. And then it's a surface implant. And so if you have adverse soft tissue conditions or, or if you have a wound problem, uh, your implant's going to be right there under the surface uh, rather than in the intramedullary uh, canal. And so another option is extended nailing. And, and so here's a clinical photograph and a, and a radiograph of nailing and extension. And this has some, uh, some significant uh, benefits uh, as well. Uh, most of us are probably familiar with what's identified as the ideal starting point for a medullary nail. So that's just medial to the lateral tibial spine on an AP view. And the ideal AP, the tibia should bisect the fibula like you see here. Uh, and then on the lateral view, you should be parallel uh, to the anterior cortex of the, uh, of the tibia. And, and this uh, is facilitated a lot of times from an extend, in an extended uh, type of position, and it's particularly important in a proximal fracture. So as you get more distal and the isthmus starts to constrain the nail, uh, 
the starting point uh, becomes a, a little bit uh, a less important, but in the proximal fracture, the, deta the details of the starting point are critical. Uh, there's just more and more information about out there uh, about extended techniques. And here is a 2016 pilot of a randomized control trial from some of the early proponents of super patellar nailing in Florida. And this is a randomized control trial of 25 patients, really responsibly done uh, with pre and post uh, arthroscopy and MRI uh, with a focus on the uh, patellofemoral joint. And so if you looked here in their uh, super patellar group, uh, there were some changes in the cartilage on the post-nailing arthroscopy in three of 11 suprapatellar patients, but no differences in function and less bodily pain in the suprapatellar group and probably most notably, no knee pain. So knee pain, one of the big issues with tibial nailing, but no knee pain in the suprapatellar group in this pilot of a randomized control trial. There's a second technique for extended nailing that everybody should know about. If you don't want to go uh, through the patellofemoral joint for whatever reason, uh, you can do an open semi-extended parapatellar approach, usually lateral parapatellar. And, and here's a randomized control trial of that done by the group in Utah, looking at almost 50 patients, lateral parapatellar versus flex nailing, showing again, no differences in knee pain. And the conclusion from these authors is that a lateral parapatellar extended nailing is no worse than a conventional infrapatellar technique. So again, extended nailing, uh, some of the pros, the imaging is easier. The limb is perpendicular to a C-arm that just rolls right in. So if you're not so familiar or the X-ray tech is not so familiar, that's a nice option. Uh, reduction, again, in the proximal fractures, you take out the extensor mechanism, implant position, probably related to better imaging, it's easier to be more precise. The main con, again, is if you have heartburn about going through or around the knee joint, uh, then that may be a downside uh, that you should consider. Blocking screws are also an option. The blocking screw, the way I think of it, is you can artificially narrow the canal and put it where you don't want the nail to go. And so if you're worried about apex anterior, a blocking screw just posterior in the proximal segment, like you see here, can be helpful. Open techniques are also very useful, I will say. It's okay to open reduce the closed fracture, especially these challenging proximal ones. And it's definitely okay, and you should always take advantage of an open fracture to obtain an open uh, a reduction in, in these types of cases. So here you see a, a whole bunch of uh, tools used, blocking shans pins, plates, and, uh, and clamps as well. So again, take advantage of the open approach. You can, you can clamp or provisionally plate. If you do provisionally plate, my own practice is to retain the plates in the metaphysis and remove them in the, in the diaphysis where I think they're less important once the nail is in. All right, and so we're gonna finish up with a brief discussion of distal fractures. Here, a common problem is valgus and external rotation. And so the options are very similar. Treat with a plate, go to the extended position, blocking screws. Unique option here is to fix the fibula. We'll talk about that briefly. And then again, open techniques. Just plate it. Again, I think there are some pros to this. It's technically, uh, I think, a little bit less uh, detail-oriented in certain ways. Uh, the outcomes are similar. There's uh, trials on one side or the other, but I think taking the literature as a whole, similar outcomes. Uh, but again, there are some cons. Biomechanically, uh, perhaps less favorable. Uh, and then again, uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is a, excuse me, um, this is a surface uh, implant. Uh, I will say that if you are uh, treating the distal tibia with a medial plate, uh, there may be some opportunities for improvement, especially in the valgus pattern. And I would suggest to you that an anterolateral plate here uh, may, be, uh, may be optimal. Again, pros, imaging, reduction, implant position, cons, intraarticular. Here's a detail that everybody should know about. Just like the starting point is important for a nail, the ending point is important. On a mortise view, the nail should be lateral in the distal tibial segment. So lateral uh, and not central. Again, this has to be on a mortise view. And if you find yourself medial in the distal tibial segment, that's a hint that you're in valgus. So here's a suboptimal tibial nailing. The nail is medial in the distal segment, and this patient is in valgus. So, so that's a, a little trick to, uh, 
to look out for subtle, or in this case, less subtle malreduction. Blocking screws are also relevant. Uh, here's a patient in my practice who uh, developed an infected non-union of an open tibia fracture. It's in a subtle amount of valgus. And so you can see here, I've used a drill bit as a blocking device, uh, allow, pushing the nail more lateral, correcting that valgus. And, and here he is with his antibiotic coated nail in place. When to fix the fibula, that's a good question. If you have an ankle injury and tibiotalar instability, that's an easy time. If you have stubborn valgus, uh, sometimes fibular fixation can help you uh, get the lateral column of the leg out to length, particularly if the fibula fracture is simple and distal, meaning accessible and, and accurately reducible. Those are good times to think about fixing the fibula. Finally, uh, uh, open techniques. Again, it's okay to open reduce a closed fracture, and it's definitely okay to open reduce an open fracture. In the distal tibia, percutaneous clamps are also pretty useful, uh, like you see here. Um, and then open approaches. And so uh, here's, a, here's a paper I'm just highlighting from Jeff uh, Marisek, who was uh, formerly of uh, USC, and uh, now at Cedar sinai uh, And I think uh, it's, you should think very hard before you extend a medial wound. If a medial wound, on the distal tibia goes bad, then that is a really big deal. And so this is a paper looking at a formal anterolateral approach for debridement of open tibia fracture, which is my preference. Um, and it's just a much more forgiving soft tissue location. And again, same as the proximal tibia, clamps, provisional plates, retain in the metaphysis, remove in the diaphysis. So in closing, the proximal and distal fibula are unforgiving and, and problematic to the uh, orthopedic surgeon on call. There are predictable deformities, apex anterior and valgus in the proximal segment, valgus and external rotation in the distal segment, and there are some uh, solutions that uh, you should uh, at least have in the back of your mind. Plating, extended position, blocking screws, uh, open reduction. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Uh, do you have, you, perfect, personally, do you have a... Uh, a preference way you personally like to lean towards plates or nails and what helps you make the distinction if you if you need to move the other way yes so in the proximal tibia uh, i prefer plating uh, i think it is technically easier and, and more reproducible um, and, and i don't see a big problem uh, with the soft tissue cost of having a plate rather than a nail in the proximal tibia. Uh, I'm also less inclined to weight bear those patients early either way, whether it's a plate or a nail. So I, so I like a plate in the proximal tibia. The times I'll go to a nail is if it, there's a segmental fracture. So if there's a diaphyseal tibia fracture down below that really wants a nail, um, like I showed in that example, then that would lead me in the direction of nail. In the distal tibia, I feel the opposite actually. Uh, I think that that is technically a little more feasible. And I think there's a larger advantage in the distal tibia where there's less soft tissue coverage uh, to not having a surface implant. So in the distal tibia, I generally like a nail unless the segment is so small that it really precludes two interlocking uh, screws. And so nail, pro nail distal, plate proximal is my go-to. So uh, Julius, when, uh, when you're talking about a plate proximally, are you referring to uh, any sort of plate, or do you mean uh, some sort of locking plate uh, with uh, bicolumnar support? Yeah, so, so good question. So if this is uh, not a tibial plateau fracture, so a metaphyseal proximal tibia fracture, uh, then my go-to there uh, would typically be a large fragment plate with locking capabilities. Uh, which in most cases will be an uh, indirect submuscular plating with locking screws into the short proximal segment and, and then usually non-locking screws into the uh, good diaphyseal uh, distal bone. It would be unusual for me uh, to be treating uh, something with dual plates uh, that's not a true tibial plateau fracture. Okay, great. All right, well, I already summed things up before I neglected uh, poor Julius, but thanks Julius for being uh, patient and uh, we'll see everybody next year at the COA.